I have that it's 1130. So um, I want to call the meeting back together. Um, we will have two presentations now um, at, that are program updates, but we'll they're separate presentations and we'll have separate question and answer um, after each and then followed by a larger open discussion. Um, a longer open discussion period. So I want to start by introducing Kathleen Atfield. Kathleen is chief of the Exposure Surveillance and Epidemiology Unit, which is part of the Exposure Assessment Section in the Environmental Health Investigations Branch, EHIB, at the California Department of Public Health, CDPH. She will give an update on current program activities and planning for future studies. And after Kathleen's presentation, We'll have five minutes for clarifying questions, and then we'll have a presentation from Susan Hurley of OEHA, and then we'll have the larger discussion on program activities um, after both presentations. So turning it over to you, Kathleen. Wonderful. Thank you, Meg. And let me just confirm that you can see my slides. Yes? Yep. Thank you. Yes, sorry, that took me a moment to find them, but I've got them. Okay, so good morning. Thank you everyone for attending today. For today's program update, I will talk through some administrative updates as well as project updates for STEPS, a project in collaboration with the Water Board, a renewal of work with the Asian Pacific Islander Community Exposures Project that was mentioned earlier, and some updates from our communications team and from our laboratories. We'd like to welcome new staff to the Environmental Chemistry Laboratory at um, DTSC, uh, Julian Edmonds, Alaria Lentrichia, and Bisha Noipain. And also acknowledge the contributions of Lily Wu, who is currently serving as Acting Chief of the Safer Alternatives Assessment and Biomonitoring Section at OEHA. Uh, last time we met, we described our developing surveillance project. And so this time we're going to offer just a short update and we'll spend more time uh, talking through uh, additional projects that are under, underway. Uh, to update you on the progress with the STEP study or the studying trends and exposures in prenatal samples, we are in the process of requesting chosen samples from the Biobank at the Genetic Disease Screening Program uh, for the years of 2015, 2018, and 2021. Uh, we are also working with staff from the Genetic Disease Screening Program uh, on planning our prospective sampling in a non-Biobank county. In our work on our California Regional Exposure Study, or the CARE study, we've been collaborating with the California Water Boards to understand data coverage and overlaps between our CRM PFAS data and their drinking water PFAS testing data. Uh, we have identified initial goals of identifying data gaps that the water board, um, where the water board could take action with investigative orders to cover these gaps. So an example of this uh, would be if there are public water systems where care participants had high blood levels, but there is no existing drinking water testing data for PFAS. We're also looking at the feasibility of different investigative questions with the different data sets. So looking at the relationships between drinking water and biomarker data to see if we can predict values of biomarker concentrations, um, as well as whether it may be possible to estimate the relative source contribution of drinking water to PFAS exposure to uh, lend a hand in risk assessments at the state. So for this effort, we are using CARE data from all three iterations, the 2018, 2019, and 2020 CARES from Eastern and South, uh, Southern California. Uh, and for uh, drinking water data, there are currently two main sources of PFAS drinking water data that we are employing. So those from the EPA's unregulated contaminant monitoring rule of UCMR3, where 
um, during which took place during 2013, 2015, and from investigative orders issued by the California Water Board in 2019 to 2021. Uh, the UCMR3 data covers mainly public water systems serving over 10,000 people and samples from points of entry to the distribution system. So the data from the investigative orders is a little different in that it mostly covers source wells uh, with some finished water and focuses mainly on areas near prior detections of PFAS or possible contamination sources such as landfills and airports. So, and there is data subsequent to this 2022 and into 2023. So there will be continuing to be a rich source of data that can be used. Uh, our first steps in looking at the data was to geocode our care participants, uh, the ones that have serum PFAS levels. And we've been matching them to water system boundaries and uh, are actually achieving a pretty good coverage. So 848 participants matched to a system out of the 872 that were geocoded. While a greater number of participants lived in water systems that had testing in UCMR3, so 96%, um, water board, uh, then water board testing, sorry, a greater number are seeing detects of PFAS in the water board data, so 53% as compared to 8%. Um, and you know, there are a good number of reasons for the difference in detection frequency. Uh, as you can see, the method detection limit is rather different between the two phases. Um, and of course, there were different sampling points that were used between the two. When we look at the data by water system, our participants match to 150 water systems with an average of seven or 10 participants per water system with a maximum of 184, and that's in the Los Angeles area. Uh, more systems were tested in UCMR3, 79% versus 50%, uh, but a greater percentage had detects in the water board testing, 64%. So we just want to present some initial looks uh, geographically. Um, you can see the geographic extent of our participants. They are jittered, so this is not their exact uh, home location, but approximate. Uh, the dots in green are below uh, the top 10%, so the bottom 90%, and in blue are the top 10%. And so for this, our initial aim with the water board was to look at folks with the higher level of PFOS and PFOA and other PFAS detections. So here we're showing the top 10% and in the gray are the polygons of the water system boundaries. And a zoomed in version here of Southern California. Um, and now the systems have been um, uh, colored with their different quantiles of PFOS concentrations. So a visual correlation is not immediately evident here, uh, but what we've learned about the overlap of these data so far is that we have identified four participants with serum PFOA or PFOS levels that are in the top 10% of participants, but who have no water testing data so far, and 11 people who are in the top 25%. So we've shared this data with the water board. They're you know, active participants in this project, of course, and they're planning to use this information in their next phase of testing requirements. Some challenges we're working with um, include assigning participants to a single water system. So the water board is in the process of validating some of the water system boundaries. So temporarily, there are situations where water boundaries may overlap. Uh, but in the process of this project, we've been able to reduce the number of participants with an overlapping situation from 274 to 91. Um, we are also contemplating how to create different summary statistics for the end drinking water user, since systems have many different sampling points and have been collecting the data for regulatory purposes, often to evaluate the raw sources, so not the finished water. We know uh, there may be other uses for the overlaps between these two data sets. So that is a question that we do have for the panel. Um, so we'd be interested in some commentary on further uses of the overlap of this data. 
So moving on to another project in progress, uh, due to our increased staffing, we're able to revisit the data analyses within the Asian Pacific Islander Community Exposures Project. Um, this was an extension of collaborations with community groups on health education and outreach related to safer fish consumption that led to a community-based study to biomonitor Asian populations uh, for metals and PFASs, uh, which, as I had mentioned, had been observed in higher levels in Asians within a prior biomonitoring California study. Uh, there were two phases for ACE, first in 2016, where we worked with APA Family Support Services to recruit 100 Chinese Americans and then oh, in the San Francisco area. And then in 2017, we worked with the Vietnamese Voluntary Association to recruit 100 Vietnamese Americans in the San Jose area. In ACE, we found a fair number of participants with levels of metals above our levels of concern that the program has for following up with participants with elevated levels to help them consider uh, different ways of reducing their potential exposures. So the slide is here as a reference of which uh, what levels we do use for our levels of concern cutoff for arsenic and for mercury. Um, and within ACE, we had seen uh, these levels that are a fair amount higher than or more frequently occurring in uh, the ACE population as versus CARE. So CARE LA, as an example here, 2 to 6% of our participants had levels above the LOCs, while in ACE, uh, 26 participants had elevated inorganic uh, arsenic in both phases of ACE. Um, and up to 16% of women of reproductive age there in the first line uh, with elevated blood mercury. Uh, as mentioned earlier, we also observed higher levels of PFAS, so five PFAS in comparison to national data, the NHANES iteration of 2016-2017. And uh, we even saw higher levels than Asians within that same cohort of NHANES for PFOS and PFNA. Um, as with metals, we had seen uh, often acculturation factors were associated with higher levels. So in, for example, birth country, time spent in the US and in interview language. And so this uh, will be instructive for outreach and educational programming with our partners, as well as our further investigations into the data. Our recent efforts on this project include reconnecting with existing stakeholders and exploring how the initial findings from the project are consistent with the group's current concerns. We're also following up on educational efforts and exploring the utility of particular additional analyses. So the additional analyses that we're circling around at the moment are looking into uh, PFAS concentrations and fish consumption, because we have a fair number of fish questions within our questionnaire, so we can address different types of fish and different parts of the fish. Um, for metals and herbal remedies and personal care products, and in a collaboration with Silent Spring Institute, they are looking at occupational exposures within um, the ACE cohort and the differentiation between those with recent immigration history versus not. Uh, we are interested in learning from the panel uh, your suggestions for other questionnaire analyte investigations that could be informative for educational and outreach efforts at the community level, as well as for enriching the general field related to PFAS and metals. Uh, we're also interested in hearing about other outreach part panel, excuse me, outreach partners the panel may have suggestions for. So I can return to this slide later. Uh, next, for updates from our outreach and communications team, uh, they uh, have been hard at work finalizing uh, the beautiful version of our care report. Um, that you've heard us mention before. So a couple um, teasers of images that are part of the care report. And there's going to be an accompanying dashboard two-page summary. Additionally, they are focusing on visual fact sheets and other accessible and engaging materials for the general public as relates to uh, information around arsenic and rice. And um, a brief 
um, briefer about our foam replacement environmental exposure study paper that is underway. So next, updates from the Environmental Health Lab. Uh, they are initiating additional environmental phenols analysis for the CARE study. So if, if you may remember that we had um, done phenols analysis on a subset for CARE LA and CARE 2. So uh, 370 for CARE LA are remaining and 190 are remaining for CARE 2. So this will be fantastic to have it for the entire cohort of both studies. Um, Oh, uh, there's a typo there. Um, the second bullet is meant to be talking about bisphenol, uh, a metabolite method that is in progress where um, the metabolites that will be able to be detected are for glucuronide and sulfate conjugates. They are also validating the speciated urinary mercury method looking into um, inorganic and monomethyl mercury. They're developing the total nickel analysis by ICFPMS uh, for use in pollution community studies, well, air pollution community studies, excuse me, and continued work on the VOC urinary metabolite method. As for our environmental chemistry lab, they uh, are finishing their instrument analysis of serum and plasma comparison for their extended PFAS method with the final data analysis in progress and have uh, updated the persistent organic pollutants method for PCBs, OC, uh, organochlorine pesticides, and PBDEs, where they've reduced the sample preparation time from 48 hours to seven hours by the use of an upgraded automated SPE system. And uh, finally, they have new methods under development for siloxane and PAHs in serum. So with that, that finishes our update portion of the presentation. And uh, I'll pass it back to you, Meg. Thank you, Kathleen. We have five minutes now for um, questions, clarifying questions, before we move to our next uh, update. So reminder that panelists, just raise your hand, turn on your camera, raise your hand, um, and I'll call on you if you have a question. Um, and webinar attendees, you can use the Q&A function or email or raise hand function. Thank you. Lara, yes, please. Hi, sorry that I, I, I'll have to jump off after this and leave early, but it's really great to see this exciting work on PFOS and the ACE project. Um, I had one quick question about the PFAS. I know the water boards has been doing, um, uh, ha has um, through a different analytical method, um, some evidence that there are many, perhaps many PFAS that are not in the typical um, uh, panel that are analyzed for mm -hmm. um, CMR3. So, I don't know if you're planning, I was curious if um, what uh, PFAS specifically are, were tested for in care and if, is there any opportunity to kind of look at not just the usual suspects, but some of the more um, obscure, less common or more recently um, put into production PFAS with that project? That's an interesting question and really of the moment. Um, for CARE, uh, both iterate, well, all three iterations used um, a method that just looks at um, the 12 legacy compounds. Sorry, making sure the cat doesn't enter the screen. Um, and for ACE, uh, that was an extended method, which used a sort of manual preparation uh, start, um, uh, method in the in the laboratory so that actually has a larger number of PFAS. Um, I don't remember the number off the top of my head, but about 30 or so. Um, for our study with steps, we're going to use that extended PFAS method, which I mentioned, which will have about 40 PFAS for it. Uh, it's an interesting question of whether we would have capacity to go back and look further at our 
um, samples for care. We do sometimes have volume restrictions and restrictions around what people have given permission for, for additional analyses that we'd have to consider. But um, it, it, that's that's an interesting question that we that we will consider. Um, looks like Nurse has a comment as well. Yeah, thanks for your question, Lara. Um, one of the issues with going back to participants, even if they have um, given permission for additional analyses, is that we are obligated to return results to people um, if we measure them. So if we are doing a method where we're sort of exploring what new PFAS is maybe showing up in people biologically, um, we have to think about what the messaging would be like. But as Kathleen said, the step samples are a very good match for this if we have enough volume because there is not a results return. Um, component, but also because we are getting a real time trend with that sampling. So we might be able to see the emergence of newer PFASs coming in um, and hopefully match that with some of the new waterboard data. Thank you, Nurse. <laughs> Great. Uh, yes, Jenny. I wanted to thank you for that update. I think it's really exciting to see California biomonitoring interface with other state agencies to really extend the reach of what we're doing. So California Air Resources Board and now the Water Board, and I just think that's a really great approach um, to take. And I'm also interested in your community kind of translation of your materials. Um, and I'm always interested in what people can actually do. You know, so for example, for the rice. Um, you're talking about uh, giving some outreach about arsenic and rice. I mean, uh, is there, I haven't really looked at my rice packages. Do they tell you where it's grown, for example? Like, don't buy it from the South where they use arsenic or, you know, um, how much information can people easily get um, to reduce, to buy rice that's cleaner as opposed to reducing rice consumption? I'm just kind of curious, again, from a naive point of view, like, how do you translate these findings into, you know, what people can use. So thank you for that. Thank you. Yes, it's not been an easy project. And I'll pass that to Narissa or Emily to speak more about. I'm sure you've identified some of the key issues we're wrestling with, um, with the Biomonitoring Outreach and Communications Group. Um, and rice is complicated because it's really, I mean, obviously the uptake is going to depend on things like soil conditions. Is it flooded or not? What's the pH in the soil? So there's so much variability that it becomes a very difficult message to convey to folks in a simple um, communication. Um, so we do have some sort of broad indicators that California rice tends to be lower than some other areas, but we want to be careful not to you know, just to be careful in our language that it's not a guarantee that eating California rice is safe. Um, but like I said, the science behind it is quite complicated and we are sort of picking our way through the messages and identifying what we can say and back up. We wanna be really careful not to recommend things that might lower the nutrient value of rice, like washing it till supplemental nutrients come out or recommending that you eat a different food that then might have elevated levels of something else. So it is it is quite a complicated process, but we have um, we've we're getting closer to um, what our messaging will look like and hope to have something to share with with this group, but um, also some of our community partners to what is an effective message soon. I just wanted to say that how often California biomonitoring has been a leader in these kind of efforts and a Really appreciate it. Um, you know, just with the results return, you know, I use that, I hand that out to people I know as an example of how to do it. And and this is another example of of leading on these kind of difficult issues, um, walking the tightrope. So I appreciate what you're doing. Thank you. Thanks, Jenny. We have time for one more brief question, if anyone has for Kathleen. Yes, Olika. Uh, thank you, um, Kathleen, for the update on all the amazing things that Biomonitoring California is doing. I just had a quick question about, you mentioned the new methods under development included siloxane and serum, and I remember years ago when these were designated by the panel, um, and I'm just wondering which are you, you know, do you know yet which ones are going to be, you know, included, which siloxanes is that, or is that still under discussion? 
This is one that I will pass to June Sue for the particulars. Mm -hmm. June Sue, are you able to join us? Yeah, yeah, no, I think uh, I understand your concerns about the silex, and we feel very bad about the this long due method development, you know, the siloxane and also the some other um, uh, the fragrance chemicals like musk. Unfortunately, you know, the, um, the we've been running the biomonitoring California program um, is our side on by you by with only two people, two step. Uh, recently, we were able to increase two more step. Uh, so that's the kind of where we were. Uh, we are getting better. Also the um, we had a, a, only a few months ago, we had a, a right instrument. Uh, it's called a, a GCMS with a special um, uh, the sampling system, auto injector system uh, can um, minimize background uh, contamination. Uh, so our designated uh, uh, biomonitoring staff, Judy Wang, um, the, she is now devoted uh, to uh, work on this method. Um, so um, I, I know it's still slow, but uh, at least we are on it. Um, so um, that's the only thing I can say for now. Hi, this is Sabrina, oh, Sabrina. Yeah. from hey, ECL. Yeah. I was just gonna quickly say, we're just looking at the cyclosiloxanes for now. So the D3, D4, D5, and D6. We may try to do some linear ones later, but um, we were having a bit of trouble sourcing certified standards for those. Does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah, Is great. That? Thank okay. you. No, it's uh, very exciting that you're moving forward on that. I think that's wonderful. Mm -hmm. Great. Okay. I'd like to um, move along and introduce uh, Susan Hurley. Susan is a research scientist in the Safer Alternatives Assessment and Biomonitoring Section, SABS, of OEHA. And uh, Susan will present an update on some of the program's community biomonitoring studies and planning for future biomonitoring studies. Okay, let me, uh, thank you, May. Let me just get my uh, slides up. Can everybody see those okay? It's not yet on presenter view. Okay, how's that look? It's good. Okay. Thanks. Um, okay, so today I'm going to start with just a, a really brief update on our um, bios, Biosphere and the Fresco Mujeres projects, and then be spending most of my time talking about um, some of the initial biomonitoring results we've got for our Stockton Air Pollution Exposure Project. So for Biomsphere, uh, recruitment and urine sample collection is currently underway and uh, will continue through the end of the summer. And if you would like any more information about that project, we've got more information posted on Biomonitoring California's webpage. You can uh, check out some of these links on the slide here. And then for our um, Fresca project, um, we are just in the very initial stages of um, getting recruitment launched and um, are planning to be out in the field in May to start the yarn collection. And that will continue uh, through early fall. And again, there's uh, more information at these links on the slides. So I'm not going to say anything more about those two projects today. And just want to move on to our Stockton Air Pollution Exposure Project, um, otherwise known as SAPEP. And um, these are the two primary objectives of the project. Um, so one is to learn more about air pollution exposures to school children in Stockton and to evaluate the um, effectiveness of school air filtration at reducing those exposures. And today, the initial results I'll be sharing are really focused on characterizing the air pollution exposures to the kids in our study. So it's really focused on this box here. I won't be talking at all about the evaluation of the effectiveness of the school air filtration because we haven't um, completed those analyses yet. So many of you have seen this slide before. 
But um, just to go over quickly what the design of the study was, um, it was conducted at uh, one school in Stockton, the All Saints Academy, where we measured air pollutant levels both inside and outside of the school, and then installed uh, air filtration units or portable air cleaners in about half of the classrooms of participating students. Parents completed online questionnaires to get some more information about uh, potential exposure sources. And then we collected uh, children's urine before and after school. And then in those urine samples, measured chemicals that could indicate exposures to air pollutants. So our goal was to um, to enroll 50 children. We actually ended up with 18, and that's primarily a reflection of trying to launch a study in the middle of a global pandemic, um, left us with very little time for recruitment and limited access to the campus. But um, the samples were collected on uh, two days of consecutive weeks in early December of 2021 where we, for each child, we collected one sample before school and one sample after school on each of those two days. So about four samples per child. So ultimately we ended up with 69 urine samples. And then those samples were sent to the clinical pharmacology lab at UCSF, where under the direction of uh, Dr. Peyton Jacob, they were analyzed for hydroxy metabolites of these four PAHs, as well as uh, stable metabolites of VOCs um, for these six VOCs. So uh, last month, we uh, sent to all the SAPEP participants their biomonitoring results for the VOCs, the PAHs, and the nicotine metabolites that were measured in their urine. And then later this year, we will send out the individual urine results for the markers of oxidative stress and inflammation that were also measured in the urine. So this is just a quick picture of who was in our study. Um, most of the kids were male, about three quarters were male. They ranged in age from five to 13 years old with most of them in the five to seven year old category. And most of the kids were Hispanic. So for the initial analyses that um, I'll be uh, showing the results for today, they're really just focused on comparing the um, metabolite uh, levels in our study for the VOCs and PAHs to those in a national, nationally representative data from children in, in Hayden's. So we did this for, so for all the samples, so regardless of, of time of day or the filtration status of their classroom. And we used uh, uh, random effects models to calculate geometric means and 95% and confidence intervals. And then we compared those metabolite levels to those found in the most recent data we could find for these analytes in kids. So for most of them, it was the NHANES 2015-16 cycle. For a couple, we had to go back to 2011 and 12. Um, and then to make our methods analogous to the methods CDC uses in reporting NHANES data, we, um, uh, we for the non-detects, we imputed the value, the imputed values equal to the level of detection divided by the square root of two. We also did not calculate geometric means for any analytes where the detection frequency was 65% um, or less. And then just before, uh, before launching into the results, I just wanna uh, call attention to uh, some of the considerations to, to be, thinking about as we're looking at these results. One is just a reminder, we have small number of samples. It's you know among 18 kids. Um, in some cases, for some of the analytes, there were some differences in the levels of detection between our lab uh, at UCSF and CDC's lab for NHANES. 
um, which should just be kept in mind in interpreting some of the um, some of the results. And then um, just calling attention to the fact that our data was was collected in 2021. We're using we're comparing to NHANES data that is mostly about five years prior, and in some cases ten years prior. So it's not a, a not a perfect comparison. Um, my my slide thing. Oh, there we go. Sorry, my cursor was misbehaving. Okay. Um, so these are for the VOCs um, for acrolein, uh, acrylonitrile, uh, crotonaldehyde, propylene oxide. You can see the um, metabolites were found in nearly all of the SAPEP participants as well as the NHANES participants. Um, for benzene and 1,3-butadiene, um, the metabolites were found less frequently, especially in SAPEP. We're seeing them found in uh, less than half of the participants. Uh, for the PAHs, um, most of the CPEP and NHANES participants showed evidence of exposures to the PAHs, the four PAHs that we looked at. Um, you can see detection frequencies are pretty high um, in both cases, even though in some for some analytes, the levels of detection are, are quite different. Um, and I guess that's all I wanted to say there. Okay. So these are um, the geometric, this is the comparison of the VOC metabolites in SAPEP versus NHANES. And um, the blue bars represent the geometric means for NHANES, the white bars for SAPEP, these little whiskers are the 95% confidence intervals. And you can see overall that the geometric means look quite similar um, across SAPEP and NHANES participants. Um, and in fact, none of these um, geometric means were uh, statistically different. And note that we don't, we're not showing benzene or 1,3-butadiene here because their detection frequencies uh, were less than 65%. Okay, so for the PAHs, it's a, a little bit of a different story. Um, here, again, the blue bars are NHANES, white bars are SAPEP. And here we see the geometric means are generally lower in SAPEP um, for fluorine, for phenanthrene, and for pyrene. And uh, in contrast, for naphthalene, this metabolite is quite a bit higher in SAPEP compared to NHANES. Um, the geometric mean here is about four times uh, what is seen in the NHANES kids. So just to briefly summarize, um, Nearly all SAPEP participants um, showed indications of exposure to acrolein, acrylonitrile, crotonaldehyde, and propylene oxide. Um, exposures to benzene and 1,3-butadiene were comparatively less common. And overall, the metabolite levels did not differ in our study from those reported in NHANES. Uh, for the PAHs, most SAPEP participants um, were exposed to fluorine, naphthalene, phenanthrene, and pyrene. And metabolite levels here were generally lower in SAPEP participants compared to NHANES, with the exception of naphthalene, um, for which the metabolite 2-naphthal uh, was significantly higher in our study compared to NHANES. So just to talk a little bit more um, about the naphthalene results, um, which are intriguing. Um, we, we haven't really had a chance to really dig deep into these findings. They're sort of hot off the presses, so to speak. Um, so, but what we can tell you is that it doesn't appear that the higher geometric means in our study are being driven just by a few high outliers. Um, all of the SAPEP participants had at least one urine sample that had a level above the, um, the median seen in, in Haynes. And we also have a lot, quite a bit of information about tobacco and vaping-related exposures. 
um, both from the questionnaire and then also from cotinine analyses. It doesn't appear that the high levels are being driven by those exposures. Um, we haven't really done a formal analysis yet to evaluate um, the association between the two naphthol and urine and the naphthalene air concentrations at the school. But just overall, the air concentrations of naphthalene in and around the school during the study period didn't seem to be especially high. And um, it should be noted that there may have been some interference in the two naphthol measurements by um, collusion with one naphthol. Um, and just a, a few more additional considerations to think about as we're trying to interpret these findings. Um, you know, reminding you all again that the NHANES data were collected five to six years before our data. And there does seem to be some indication from US and European biomonitoring surveillance data that shows urinary 2 naphthol levels um, seem to be increasing in recent years. And then sort of relatedly, we don't have much biomonitoring data yet um, in populations uh, from sort of the post-COVID or during COVID years. And so, you know, what we know about primary sources of naphthalene exposures, which include um, air emissions from fossil fuel combustion, tobacco smoke, use of mothballs, that um, th those all come from information gathered before the pandemic. And we all know the world has changed a lot in the last few years. So perhaps there could be newer unrecognized sources of naphthalene that, that might be emerging as important. Um, and then also, it's important to note that other chemicals besides naphthalene might contribute to urinary uh, to naphthal levels. So as I said, we haven't really had a chance to really drill down into the data and sort of figure out what's going on. Um, we are intending certainly to do more detailed analysis of the SAPEP data that will include not just looking at the urinary levels and up to naphthol, but also um, considering the naphthalene air concentration values that we have, some of the questionnaire data to see if uh, they point to any particular predictors of exposure. Um, we can also look beyond the SAPEP data and look at other data that may be available um, that could indicate sources in the San Joaquin Valley or in, um, or in Stockton that could be um, driving these results. Um, and then we certainly are uh, planning to do a, a literature review to get a better understanding of the pharmacokinetics of naphthalene and the specificity of 2-naphthal as a biomarker of exposure. So um, beyond, uh, you know, just digging deeper into our naphthalene results, um, and some of the initial results of the other metabolites. We now are, um, are ready to, um, to really look at all the data in its totality. So conduct an integrated analysis of the biomonitoring, the air quality, and the questionnaire data to really address the primary aims of the study. So to further characterize air pollutant exposures and potential predictors of those exposures, to um, explore associations of the PAH and VOC metabolites with the biomarkers of oxidative stress and inflammation, which may uh, provide some insights towards potential health effects, and to evaluate the effectiveness of the school air filtration. So, you know, we may have a small, we do have a small sample size. It's unlikely the biomonitoring data is going to be able to answer all these questions, you know, all by themselves. But we do have a wealth of data that we've collected in this small study. And hopefully by, you know, each piece will provide a, a little clue when we put it all together, um, could help uh, give us some good insights into answering, you know, some of our study questions. So that with that, I will finish up and um, thank you for your attention and happy to take any questions. Thanks so much, Susan. I appreciate the presentation. Um, we have 
Let's take five minutes for uh, panel questions, clarifying questions about the presentation. And then we have a longer stretch for open discussion and input on both update presentations. So questions for Susan. I want to acknowledge there's a comment or a question in the chat, but that's more um, directed toward um, the previous speaker. And so um, we'll return to that in our open discussion section session. Jenny, you had a question. Hi, um, thank you for that presentation. And it's exciting to, again, measure these metabolites and uh, look into community solutions like you're doing. I think that's great. Um, I did have a question about the NHANES data, um, especially they're finding that the pH levels were higher in the NHANES um, population for many of the pH metabolites. and you know, I'm always struck when I look at NHANES data about how much more exposure to tobacco smoke that children have across the United States than they do here in California. And I'm just wondering if you got the NHANES data and really screened out anybody with cotinine indicating any kind of environmental tobacco smoke exposure, if that would be a more fair comparison between the two. And I'm talking about just really high levels, but even fairly low levels of cotinine are indicating tobacco smoke exposure and are so much more common in other states, um, to be honest. So I'm just kind of curious whether that would go away or even have show an opposite effect if, if that was removed. Um, and then my other comment was, and this is just from my very, not very good memory, but I, I seem to remember in the Central Valley and in the Imperial Valley that naphthalene is thought to be a marker of agricultural burns. And I know you said the air at the school was not particularly high, but I'm not sure exactly where these children live. Um, and I also remember it was triggered from your picture that I think you had one of your sampling events was raining a lot. And so perhaps that would not be an issue anyway. They can't really burn in the rain. But yeah, anyway, I just kind of curious. Um, that is a fairly unique exposure to Central Valley residents. Um, so that was something that I was interested in. Thank you. Yeah, uh, thanks for those questions. Um, so on the smoking related issue, I can't remember now, and I, um, I'm not sure if, I think Dan is on the line, but um, we did, so these are uh, the comparison we used for in Haynes was kids in the same age range. And I can't remember, and Dan, if you're on, if you could jump in, if we were able to screen out the non-smokers, I think we were, but of course that wouldn't screen out passive smoking exposures. Um, yeah, I meant pass, passive smoking. You meant, yeah, okay. Even if the parents were non-smoking, doesn't mean they don't go see grandma that smokes. And so it's, right. you have to get the data set and eliminate those people with, or those children with higher cotinine values, uh, higher passive smoke values, I guess. Yeah, it's, I mean, you know, it's, it's, it's curious because I think all of these um, PAHs have significant sources from tobacco, you know, or tobacco is a significant source. Um, so it's kind of weird that we see a flip with naphthalene being higher in our population and the others lower. So it might be a complicated story. And then um, as, in terms of the agricultural burning, um, yeah, I, I that certainly is a recognized um, source of napsaline in, you know, general populations. I don't know, I don't at my fingertips have information about, um, you know, what it specifically looks like in the Silicon Valley. Um, although we did come across an interesting like doctoral thesis or unpublished data from UC Davis that a student did that showed that um, naphthalene concentrations in wheat were higher in the Silicon Valley than they were in the Sacramento Valley, which was just kind of interesting. Um, I don't know how much agricultural burning of wheat happens in the in the uh, valley, but um, yeah, very good thoughts. And then in terms of the rain, uh, oh, did I just, I just got a text message. I think I said Silicon Valley again. I meant San Joaquin Valley. 
sorry. Uh, um, what was I going to say? Oh, about the rain. So yeah, we haven't we haven't had a chance. Like literally, we were just churning out these results a couple weeks before this meeting. So we haven't really had a chance to look to see um, separately, looking separately at week one versus week two. And and it could be that the rain is, um, you know, going to cause us some problems in interpreting some of the week two data. Thank you. Yeah. Any other clarifying questions? In that case, we'll move on to the open discussion section about um, both of these two previous presentations. Um, with regarding Susan's presentation, um, the program is interested in feedback on these results, the initial VOC and pH results from CEPAP, including any insights or resources you might be aware of to further explore and interpret the two NAPFL findings. And then um, for Kathleen's presentation, we have sort of a series of follow-up questions. And I wonder if it would be best for um, Kathleen to re uh, share that slide. Certainly, would you like to start with comments on Susan's first? Uh, while sure. I bring them? Yeah, that's fine since it's uh, the information that's just been presented. That'd be helpful. Any guidance from panelists on how to think about these results or resources? There's nothing further to add there. We can go to um, Kathleen's slide with questions, sort of follow-up questions for the panel and discussion points. Sure, just a moment. And while she's doing that, I could always read the um, public question. I have a hand from Ulrika, hang on one second. I just had a quick question related to the naphthalene. Um, Susan, do you did you ask about mothballs in the questionnaire? We did not. Oh, <laughs> that's too bad. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, that would be helpful. <laughs> Stephanie, do you want to um, read the question that was a follow-up question for Kathleen? Yeah, um, this is from Jen one of our attendees, she says, thanks for the great presentations. Uh, can anyone speak to the water board's implementation of the new requirement for all water systems, regardless of size, being tested for PFAS? Um, I live in a very small water district serving 815 homes and our watershed includes a ski resort. There are papers showing higher PFAS levels in ski resort impacted watersheds and I'd like us to test. However, there's concern about costs since our rates are already double the area water rates and about to increase. Can I, I can address some of that, if that's okay. Please go ahead. Oh, hi. I'm sorry I was late coming to the meeting. I'm Tom McCollum. Um, so it, this is an interesting question because I think it, uh, I can't really address the question of cost, but the there's been a lot written lately and a lot of discussion about uh, recreational equipment in general and ski equipment and ski uh, waxes and this specifically. So in, in, in the recreation field, there's a lot of um, water resistant, water repellent uh, boots, uh, clothing, uh, rain gear. And in skiing, uh, the same thing applies, specifically applies people uh, want clothing that is uh, water resistant, water repellent. Um, and uh, in cross-country skiing, and I think somewhat in downhill skiing, uh, the waxes that they use to coat the surfaces are have fairly high concentrations. There's been some work showing the high concentrations of uh, PFAS in these substances. So it does raise this concern uh, that 
uh, particularly ski areas where there's so many people concentrated uh, with this kind of equipment, you know, and you know, falling into the snow or or skiing across the surface, that there is a concern about the watershed. So um, it's it's a legitimate concern, and I think for me it raises getting to um, uh, Kathleen's bigger points about how do we use some of the water data. I, th I think. Uh, it would be useful to sort of do some cross comparisons of hotspots and, and address this question. You know, I don't really know. I mean, there's concern because people measure, mainly measure the PFAS compounds in ski waxes, ski equipment, um, uh, boots, water, waterproof boots, coatings for things. And I don't know if there's been a lot of corresponding focus on watersheds that are specifically linked uh, and again, maybe uh, ski areas again because they're so concentrated, but other recreational areas. And then the other comment would be: Should we be thinking more broadly about how to use water system data to look for hotspots, areas where there's like occupational or uh, production facilities that would be uh, uh, producing these, and we might expect to find a hotspot in the water supply. So um, these are just some thoughts, but thank you. Uh, for the, the for the question, because I I do think it gets to the core of some of the things we're trying to answer. Um, I just want to give a moment for we had an, I know we had a couple members of the staff from the water board attending today. I, I I did get a message that one had to drop off, but I just wanted to give a chance in case there's a member who would like to speak to this point. Otherwise, I can give an approximate answer. So what I know of the 2023 required testing that they're asking of all public water systems in the state is that they're that they are working on contracts for funding um, for smaller community systems. So the ones that are defined as disadvantaged communities and severely disadvantaged communities with, uh, I believe the definition is uh, uh, disadvantaged communities being at 80% of the state median income and severely being at 50% of the state's uh, median income. So I know the, the contracts are in process now, but have not been released. Thanks for that. Kathleen, do you mind showing the um, slide that had your sort of follow-up questions? Oh, uh, well, there were two sets. There was sort of one, one set of follow-up questions wasn't actually on a slide and it was related to this overlap of the um, EPA UCMR3 data as well as the water board data as far as what other uses the um, panel might suggest that we put the overlap of data with. So this is just a reminder of the data that we have mostly available to us so far. We don't have all the 2022 data, of course. <laughs> So this question is sort of getting at um, what other uh, projects or organizations might you contact in terms of thinking about um, PFAS in drinking water that can complement or inform this work. Is that the point, Kathleen? Yeah, we were also interested in that you know, sort of different investigative questions that could be that could be uh, looked at with the. Um, serum data as well as the drinking water data. These are sort of the two that are top on our list, but we want to make sure all this state collected information is used to the best of its extent. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, Ulrika. Sorry, I was muted. <laughs> oh, no, no, that's okay. <laughs> you know, kind of apropos of that, I so. Do you have data? Did you ask all these participants about, you know, their source of drinking water, like whether they drank mainly bottled water versus tap water or if they filtered it, those kinds of questions? 
Yeah, so we asked two questions in care. One, um, what is the main source of water in your home? Uh, and the possible answers were public water system, private well, and then other and missing, obviously. And uh, the other question was, what kind of water do you drink most of the time? And that got at if people were drinking tap water, filtered, store-bought, bottled, or other water source. So for uh, the main source of water to the home, about 92% across the three cares said public water system. Um, yeah, only 1.5% yeah, said that they were on private wells. And then what kind of water do you drink most of the time? There's a fair split actually, uh, tap water being about 14% across the studies, filtered 41%. Uh, store-bought bottled water, water coolers, 40%. So, well, And have you had a chance to look at any of those and how they were associated with the PFAS in the participants or not yet? We haven't looked at that yet. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thanks. We thought that question might come, <laughs> so I had the data available for you. Thank you to Toki Filman for that. And I, the other slide you were alluding to, Meg, I can fast forward to. Uh, that was for our ACE work. Sorry for the flashing of slides. So these are sort of our prioritized investigations, uh, the, the fish consumption and PFAS and herbal remedies and personal care products and uh, metals. Um, but we had a very rich survey. So um, if the panel wanted to highlight other sorts of investigations for both community education as well as uh, enlightening the scientific community, it would be great. And also, if it's helpful, Meg, I could at least um, show a slide with the discussion questions that um, we had. Oh, great. <laughs> I didn't know. Great. Let's sit with these um, for a minute that shows the other information available from the questionnaire results so folks can think for a minute about potential other research questions, either for the program or for outside collaborators. And then um, we could bring up that slide with the other questions. That'd be great, Stephanie. Ulrika, please. Yeah, related to a point that Jenny brought up earlier, did in the rice, where among the 18 questions about rice products or rice included like where the rice was grown, you know, or if they, you know, tried to buy rice that was from specific regions because they knew, you know, because they, the levels of, uh, you know, arsenic, for example, were found to be lower. I do believe we do have um, some information about rice origin in these questionnaires. If is Kelly Chen able to to comment? I know she has a competing. Yes, uh, I will allow her to speak now. And Kelly just have to move some data. Um, we do have the country of origin of the rice eaten most frequently. That is one of the questions we ask participants. But not like region within the US. Just country. Okay. Because there is a there's you know some data out there about the southeast, like Louisiana area having higher levels due to the use of pesticides <laughs> um, previously on cotton fields where they now grow rice versus California having lower concentrations um, of arsenic in the, in the rice. I guess we've talked about before, um, the bags are not always labeled and sometimes they'll say product of the USA. So it's, it is um, difficult to know, you know how good that data is that we've collected from folks. Um, but also, I think there's there is something about access of data. I know when I go to Berkeley Bowl or Whole Foods, it talks about what farm your rice came from and a lot about the agricultural source. But that's not true of a lot of rice products. And so um, we'll have to see how that, that bears out in Kelly's analyses. 
Thanks. Other thoughts about um, directions of inquiry or research programs based on uh, research questions, sorry, based on the information um, that's available to the program through the exposure questionnaire. If no more specific thoughts about that, maybe Stephanie, you could bring up um, a slide that proposes some general discussion questions for the remainder of our session here. Yep, we'll do. See that okay? Can everyone see that? That's great. Great. So the question, the Kathleen slide that we were looking at is um, that first bullet point. And then the third bullet point is, gets to the issue of the overlap between PFAS monitoring and water testing. Thoughts on any of this or other, other reflections from the two program update presentations are welcome at this point. Jenny. Are we, am I correct in thinking we're supposed to be answer these questions that you're showing right now? Is that what you just said? Yeah, I think if you have any comments okay. um, or suggestions for the program, it's all welcome. Oh, okay. Um, now I was just thinking about tribal communities and ski areas, I guess, following up on the participant who um, made the comment that and also thinking about California and the, the large tribal communities. And I'm just thinking, um, curious how much we've reached out to tribal communities for issues that California biomonitoring might be assisting with. Um, so that just came up to my mind. Um, and uh, the other thing that came to my mind was, was occupational exposures, again, using the power of this this analysis to look at occupational exposures um, and especially, and this is just a question I was just thinking of, we had this great textbook I used to use, case studies in occupational health. I'm sure Elrica remembers that one. It's just really nice case studies from, I think it was NIOSH. And for example, Vietnamese Americans and solvent exposures. Um, and I'm just curious if there's, if there's exposures that track with occupations that we should, in California, that we should be and especially um, specific communities that we could be could be really helping to investigate. So uh, kind of a very general question or comment. Thank you. Thank you for the occupational question. We do have a fair amount of occupational information, both for ACE and for the care studies. And as I mentioned earlier, our collaborators at Silent Spring Institute are looking into uh, the occupational exposures and doing all the hard work of uh, classifying the open-ended um, answers that people provide into categories that can be better associated with the exposure um, analyte levels. Um, and for care, that's something we haven't had a lot of time to explore yet, but we both have open-ended questions on it and categorical questions like you know, military service or firefighting. Um, though some of those are going to be quite low in number, so we may not be able to have the power to analyze. Yeah, I'm just thinking, if I remember correctly, we oversampled older non-Hispanic white women. And so it'd be nice to kind of really focus on some of, in the future, I just feel like this is such a powerful tool for bringing attention to exposures. And occupational exposures are often so very much higher than the general population. Um, and they affect their families too, like with take-home exposures. And so I was just hoping we can keep thinking of that as we move forward. Thank you. Tom. Yeah, I have, I have some thoughts about or have always 
been concerned about water testing and, and matching the exposures. Um, I mean, this goes back to when we were doing um, exposure tracking. And, you know, there's one thing to do to match people to their air because pretty much people breathe the air where they live. But that's not true of water. And I don't know how much this can be used to really try to understand a little bit more about, you know, the, you know, the, the chemicals in your water are related to not where you live, but where the water you drink comes from. Now that's somewhat related to where you live, but not always it gets uh, water distribution systems are a bit complicated. So I, I don't know, I'm just a suggestion about it might enhance the ability to understand the biomonitoring if there's a little more effort to do some um, uh, mapping of water supply to water consumption. Again, it's not, it's actually, we, I mean, we've tried to do this before, it's a bit difficult. Uh, it, it involves a lot of uh, records with the water companies because they actually switch sources at certain, some of them use uh, uh, surface water for some of the year, or they'll go to local groundwater for another part of the year. So again, it's just a thought about how to enhance or better understand that to match people to um, their water supply and particularly the variations in where that water supply comes from. So what's coming out of their tap. And I guess, I mean, an, an additional thought in that area is I forgot whether you put this in the questionnaire. I came in late. I might have missed this. Is um, you ask people about how much they have home gardens or consume food they produce, you know, in their own backyards? You don't do that, okay? Because that's actually a way for for some of these more persistent chemicals that bind uh, to vegetation. Um, yeah, it's actually an issue. Of, you know. If somebody has a home garden and consumes any significant amount of food from it, I know it was, it was an issue with uh, uh, other chemicals. But anyway, it's just just some thought. Uh, and chicken eggs internationally. <laughs> um, to respond to the first part of your comment, um, yes, water distribution systems are quite complex, um, and we. Uh, as I said, we have sort of a diversity of data around um, different sampling points and different sampling time points uh, from the different water systems. Uh, our partners at the Water Board do have access to schematics of uh, how the how the different point sources um, funnel into different treatment situations and then into the di distribution point. Um, and may be able to access information on blending and when certain wells are turned off and when different sources are employed. But as, <laughs> as I'm stating it, it is all very complex. So we're still in the point of assessing like exactly how much we'll be able to incorporate into the work. Hmm. Marissa. Hi, I just wanted to respond both to Tom and also to Jenny's question that we we sort of um, went by um, about tribes. And, and we did, we have reached out to tribal organizations as part of our EJ listening sessions that we did now quite a few years ago when we were trying to identify what were concerns about environmental health across the state. So we do have some data on that. And of course it is, um, a group when we do our demographic analyses for any of our any of our results is a group for which they're very very small numbers and so we haven't been able to produce um, stable statistics for that group um, but i'm thinking that for both occupation and for tribes um, the steps data which will eventually be a larger data set we have we do have parental occupation we will have um, racial identity by you know non exclusive category so we will be able to look at people any you know anyone who checks off native american as part of their identity um, and maybe accumulate numbers over time that might be able to be help us um, summarize any of those statistics um and with regard to tom's, tom's question I, I mean this is a little bit of what we're talking about with matt's um presentation 
there are so many variables, there's so many different sources. There are lots of things we wanna capture for any study we're doing. Um, and it's difficult. It's one of the things for which, which explains why we need such large numbers for any one of these studies. But every questionnaire, if we're not focusing on like the 20 questions you could ask about rice, if you're gonna do that for every exposure source, you end up with a very, very large questionnaire and you start bumping up against what participants are willing to answer and also how much time they're willing to, um, to spend, which is why the power of something like NHANES, which collects so much information, you know, why, why they have so much more power than we do. But it's something we think about, um, and some of these smaller studies, which can really delve down like ACE into very particular exposure sources, are a good complement for the surveillance work we do, which we can't ask about everything that we're interested in. Before we go to public comment, um, open public comment, any more points um, for this discussion session? Or Stephanie, if there's anything um, that has come across the email. Uh, this is Farrell, there's no new emails. Okay. Thank you. In that case, Thank you to both Kathleen and Susan for your presentations. And our last agenda item is an open public comment period. Um, so um, we have 10 minutes allotted for this if necessary. Um, and commenters can provide com opinions on any topic related to biomonitoring California. And a reminder that webinar attendees can submit written comments and questions either via the Q&A function of Zoom webinar or by email to biomonitoring at oehha.ca.gov. Um, we'll read them out loud. If you wanna speak, please use the raise hand feature in Zoom um, and I can call on you. So maybe we'll just leave a few minutes here, um, even if uh, no one's raising hands to let folks submit via the various mechanisms. Stephanie, that sound good? Uh, yep, and we do actually have a hand raised, uh, Nancy. Everybody, Nancy Biermeyer, Breast Cancer Prevention Partners. As always, thank you for all of the presentations and all of the great work. And it's great to see the additional resources allowing you to do more of those um, analysis that that is so useful to the work that all of the advocates do. Um, I had a question. It's I, I wasn't able to attend all of the meetings, so I don't know if this is possible, but I thought I heard something about looking at bisphenols um, in, I don't know if it was care data or some of the other things, but there is some legislation this year um, in the legislature in California to ban the use of BPA and BPS on thermal paper. And so having any data on sort of particularly occupational exposures for cashiers or retail uh, workers who have to handle those on a daily basis and their exposure to BPA or BPS. I don't even know if you work on BPS or not, but anyway, I was just curious if you could talk a little bit about whether that data might be coming. So for care, and thank you, Nancy, um, it's great that this is so topical to um, what is happening in the legislature right now. So for CARE LA and CARE 2, we had a subset where we were measuring uh, environmental phenols. And so we're actually working on expanding that to the rest of the CARE population. So hopefully in, in a year or two, we'll be able to deliver information on that. Um, what I had mentioned about bisphenol A was a method development work um, from the Environmental Health Laboratory at CDPH, where they're um, developing the ability to track the specific metabolites um, of BPA in addition to the free form. So that's BPA, but the, um, the regular method does BPA and BPS, and I believe BPF. <sighs> 
Um, and that the data that is available for the subsets is already up on our website and can be viewable. We're happy to send you a link as well or post a link. Great, thank you. Cheryl, anything by email that we should tend to? I believe Stephanie's the only person who can see that at the moment as I'm screen sharing. Oh, no, uh, no further emails. In that case, Stephanie, is there any, um, do we, uh, do, do we need to keep it open um, for the full 10 minutes or um, is it okay to adjourn, adjourn a little bit early? Uh, we can adjourn a little bit early if there are no further public comments. Okay, in that case, um, we will move toward adjournment. There will be a transcript of the meeting posted on the Biomonitoring California website when it's available. And the next SGP meeting will be on August 21st, 2023 from one to 4 p.m. Um, and information regarding options for attending that meeting will be available closer to the August meeting date. So thank you to the staff who put together the uh, meeting and um, to the panel for being here and the audience also um, and our speakers and I'll join, adjourn the meeting. Thanks. <laughs>